evening, everyone, and thank you for coming here this evening. Um, I will just run you through the format of the evening. Mr. Robinson will be doing a speech for the first um, 40 minutes, um, and then we will, it will be followed by a question a Q and A session. So please do um, get involved and um, sort of ask questions. Without further ado, Mr. Tommy Robinson. First of all, I'd like to say it's a privilege and honour to be standing here today. This is a long way from the streets of Luton Town to now be at the Oxford Union. I think it's a good day for freedom of speech. You've all heard well, this. I was getting called a little fascist as I was walking in here. There's protests outside from Unite Against Fascism. Who, the definition of fascism is trying to stop people have a difference in opinion of you, which is what I have. So I think they're showing themselves up as fascists. I'd like to thank, I know there's probably been a backlash against the union for inviting me here today. It's been a good day for freedom of speech, but also a bad day. I had a speech prepared that I was going to come here and talk about, everything I had prepared to say. I was visited four days ago by probation, and I was warned about my licence. I'm on an early release from custody, so I'm on a licence. And certain things that I was going to say would result in me getting recalled back to prison. Now, even though which I said, obviously, I haven't got the same freedom of speech as what everyone else has got then. And they said, no, not whilst, not whilst you're on licence. And I was going to expose certain things about the police, but that'll have to hold now. What I want to do is I want to take you all through a journey of my life and talk to you about life stories growing up in Luton. By the end of it, I want you to understand where I come from and who I am. And why. I think why is the major question. Why was the English Defence League a phenomenon? Why was it born in Luton? Why was it started? What are the reasons that brought it there? I'm going to talk to you about Luton. I was born in 1982. When I was born in 1982, we had one mosque. I just want you to understand the demographic of the town. In 2014, we now have 30 mosques. The projected government growth forecast for the Pakistani and Bangladeshi community of Luton by 2030 is to increase by 70 to 77%. This would not be a problem if we didn't experience the problems we see related within the community. At the same time as I talk you through this, I don't want for one minute to you, for you to think I'm tiring all Muslims as bad. I'm just giving you a projective view of my life. I want you to understand the stories that have happened. I'll start with my cousin, Jeanette, or my cousin's cousin. She was sexually abused. She was groomed. It's what we now know as grooming. She was raped. She woke up one day. She, she was found running semi-naked from Berry Park. Berry Park is the area where a lot of the Muslims have congregated and live. It's where these 30 mosques are. She was picked up by prostitutes in the street. Her dad collected her. If I talk about the failures from the police, when the family, I want you to understand and try and picture this as though it's your family relative. When the, police, when the family were going to the police, when the, when, the, when the girl is missing for two days, three days, yeah, and there is no response, and up until the Rotherham report, people wouldn't believe these stories, because they are unbelievable. They would say she's a drug addict, because in the end she was a drug addict because she was hooked on heroin that they were giving to her. She would climb out of the bedroom window to get back to them for her fix. The failures everyone now knows from the police force on these issues, but I want to just talk you through. When I was at school, the high school I went to, you had the Muslim playground and you had the non-Muslim playground. That's the same in pretty much every school in Luton. It wasn't divided through racial lines, it's divided through religious lines. We didn't cause that division. My friend at school, I was seeing a girl called Charlotte, she's from a beautiful, a lovely Irish family, and I was 12 years old, and my friend Razwan was seeing her friend Lisa. And I can remember Lisa's, Lisa phoning up Charlotte hysterical because Razwan's family had all gone up to Lisa's house to, to threaten the family to say that they couldn't see or speak to each other. As, as a 12-year-old boy, this was a light bulb moment for me to think, what is this about? There was another boy around the corner from, my, from where I live called Jamie. He, went, he fell in love with an Asian girl at school. He got violently attacked for that. When they went to sixth form, Luton sixth form is the, the, the main sixth form in Luton town. I could have gone to sixth form. I've got 11 GCSEs, I've got an A in maths, five Bs, five Cs. To, as a young English lad in the town, to go to that sixth form, I have to be prepared to look at the ground. And I'm not prepared to look at the ground. That's because there were Pakistani Muslim gangs in that sixth form, extremists in that sixth form. Now, 
They went to, Jamie, this Jamie went to sixth form, his girlfriend went to sixth form, who's in lo, who he's in love with, they couldn't even acknowledge that they knew each other, okay, because of the fear of what would happen. I had another friend, John English, on a night out, I'm just taking you through stories. John English, his girlfriend's name was Akvinda, she was a Sikh actually, but she was from Letchworth. But we were out on a night out in Luton Town, and these Muslim lads just come over and spat straight in her face. So these are instances, and I'm not saying it's all Muslims, I'm just talking saying there are problems. I've seen them, okay, growing up through Luton, and I'm asking that you all try and envisage yourself, take yourself out of where you've grown up. Many of you may have grown up in working class communities and towns, but try and see it. We talk about racial abuse. I don't know how many people have been a victim of racial abuse. I was a victim of racial abuse at the age of 12, when I was attacked on the way home from a swimming pool by a Pakistani gang. I was called a white pig. My friend had his hat taken off him, we were spat in our face and slapped. Another incident, twice in one night, walking to the under 18s nightclub. Whilst I'm talking about racial abuse, I'll talk about Mark Sharp. Mark Sharp was murdered in 1995. Any of you can Google this murder. Yeah? He was my uncle's friend and his son was my age. He was going to get a takeaway. He was in his car, a van. He was going to get a takeaway when he, a, a car braked in front of him. He, he swerved around it and he gave a hand gesture. He was followed. He didn't know he was being followed. Four Muslim Pakistanis were in the car. They phoned for reinforcements. More come. He was not aware of this. When he got outside the kebab shop, he come out, his son's with him. They beat him. They hit him so many times, they were hitting him with bats, with poles, with sticks. Read the murder, it will shock you. Okay? He was not going down. He would not go down. One of them jumped up in the air with a knife and snapped it off in his forehead. He, lived, he survived for three days and then he died. Many of his friends, what I'm trying to envisage and ask you is that you just take yourself, think of this, this is someone you know in your family, this has happened to. The judge in court said, you can take, if you wish to ver a verdict of manslaughter, you can take into account the fact that he aggravated them enough to make a young Asian male act in this way. They got four years in prison for that, if you want to talk about justice. That's not justice. They were out within two years in the town of Luton Town. Most of the people in Newmark and his friends left Luton after that incident. I could stand here all day and talk about other incidents that have gone on. I'm going to show you a video now. I'll ask you to watch. A series of attacks on the homes of elderly people in Luton are racially motivated. The victims fear the aim is to force them to sit up and move out. This is the latest attack, a beer keg thrown through the window of a 74-year-old great-grandmother in the middle of the night. It's the third time it's happened. The last was on Christmas Eve. You can imagine Christmas Eve and somebody filling a brick through your window, how it felt. When you, everything's supposed to be jolly and happy, you feel down, innit? Mm. And they are bringing brick through my window and run. They are cowards. In the next street, another couple who've been targeted repeatedly. At night time, I personally can't sleep. And you don't know what next they will do. You wonder sometimes if they're going to put petrol or boom or something through the letterbox. And around the corner, this house. It looks unlived in. In fact, it's been home to one couple for 60 years. Now so terrorized, they won't take down the boards. Because it always happened between about one and four o'clock in the morning. And you were really worried, sick, wondering what was going to happen next. Because there weren't just little bits of stones of things. These were real house bricks and lumps of concrete that they'd thrown through the window. Meanwhile, families are doing what they can to protect themselves. I'm more, I am one of the old type determined black women. I am not going nowhere. If they don't like me here, they can go. I'm quite happy where I am. Scared, but most of all angry, they're not moving. Now, again, maybe take it to the community you live in. You know these people, because I know the Palmers and I know the Howards. Yeah? You can imagine eruptions this sort of, these sort of incidents cause in your community. There was actually 30 people's houses that were attacked at these times. There was 88 attacks before the police acted. The way we see, what we're seeing in, in the Rotherham report is it shows the police inability, conspiracy with the police and different orga uh, organisations, social services, where they downplayed it and suppressed it because they didn't want to be deemed as racist, yeah? So, 
Crimes went up, they facilitated the rape of a generation of kids for 20 years due to not wanting to be called racist. Similar things, when the police haven't acted, they haven't acted in towns and cities and communities like Luton for incidences like this. That's why again, what I want you to understand is, I know those families, I remember these times when these things were happening. And if that were, if you watch the actual video, the Howards, it was Muslims that offered them support, it was Muslims that offered them help. I'm not painting a picture, all Muslims want them to move out of that community. I just want you to understand there are problems in these communities. There's problems that need addressing, they need talking about, okay? Now, I'll play, I want you to ask yourselves as well, do you think it's got better or worse? That was years ago. Seriously, do you think it's got better or worse? It hasn't got better, okay? I'm now gonna show you a video from six months ago. Yeah, just talk me through, tell me a story. Okay, well, um, about five years ago, I, I got rid of my car. And um, uh, I, I became more prominent in the streets of New York. And uh, I started noticing people growling as they would pass me, or, or people were spitting very close to me in the, in the streets. And uh, after, after about a few months, I realized actually they're spitting at me. And um, I, I, I faced quite a lot of, um, a lot of anger. Uh, I faced quite a lot of um, uh, just aggression from, from various younger Muslims, uh, younger Muslims in the community, uh, simply because I was a Jew, or rather a conspicuous Jew in the college. And uh, one time I, I was cornered in the college, I was shoved into the corner, and I was made to justify the existence of Israel. Well, I've got post-traumatic stress disorder, Genius. and I, I experienced a lot of panic attacks. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, it's, yeah. You've been living in, under, under a barrage of abuse and threats and intimidation for years? Yes, um, yeah, five years now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been coming up for 300 uh, incidents, attacks in, on me and my home. And uh, it probably wouldn't be so bad if I knew that you know, maybe the authorities would, would have my back, but unfortunately they don't. I do think every morning, you know, I'm still here, exactly. and I, I go to bed at night. I live today, you know. I've seen, I've seen the image of your property. It's, it's like four knocks now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my friends that, uh, I mean, I, I had to stop my friends coming to the house because I couldn't guarantee their safety. So I never have friends at the house. I always meet my friends outside. Um, I, I can't have family to live with me because it's too dangerous. Uh, I, I live in... See, this is 2014 in a borough of London. 2014. Do you know what it's like to see a grown man brought to tears? Do you know how many families I meet that are brought to tears in Luton and towns like that? What, the reason why I'm showing you these videos, I want you to understand this is real life. This is not made up. When we're talking about issues and the reason why we're passionate about these issues, we're not making it up. And at the same time, He's the first to say the vast majority of Muslims are not involved in this in any way. But there is a problem. The reason why I met him, I've been talking to him for five years. A lot of people in, with the English Defence League, they didn't go to the police anymore in towns like Luton. They contacted us to talk about the issues, talk about what's happening with their families, how they're feeling persecuted, etc. I went to meet him because he's moving to Israel. Because he feels he has to move to Israel if he wants to be safe. His only crime is that he's Jewish and he's living within a Muslim ghetto. And now as we're talking through, we all remember September 11th. I think everyone should remember where they were on September 11th. I was at Luton Airport on my apprenticeship. I remember everything. And then I remember getting a phone call again about Luton Sixth Form from a friend who was at the Sixth Form. That's the age I was at. I was probably 18 but going back to then. Saying that Muslims were cheering and celebrating. Now, a lot of these things may sound unbelievable. Yeah? When I then went to the, my local shops in my estate, I see Magnificent 19 posters across the estate, yeah? glorifying these people. On the first anniversary, we saw in my hometown of Luton, imagine this is your town where you live. You've got posters glorifying terrorism. You've got billboards, as you walk up your street, the billboards are now painted over. Anything showing a woman's flesh is covered up. This is all to fit in with Sharia. And it's from certain sections, a, minor, a minority, but a dangerous minority within the town. I want to take you through and I want you to try and understand, as me growing up, the changes I'm seeing, they're not for the good, okay? They're not for freedom. So here's, this will just show some posters. That's the covering up on billboards, the Magnificent 19 posters on a phone box. At this same time, at Icknield High School, 
Many of you may, may remember the girl who wore the, cab, the, the full base veil in the cab to school. Sherry Blair represented her. Yeah? When she left there, when she got kicked out of that school for doing that, she went to the school I used to go to, Putridge. But her brother was part of Al Mujahideen, an extremist organisation. They used to protest outside the school all the time, this Icknield High School. They then had, at the, sa the same time, every year, they're outside the school handing out leaflets saying Christmas is a sin. Children are just trying to go to school, trying to paint a picture that things are going on across the town at this time. Now, what I'll show you now, this is a newspaper article. If you, if you want to take one of them and pass them around, people can read them themselves. This, I feel, is very important. I think it's very important to show you where we were at in a town. This newspaper article is from September. September 2004. You're going back 10 years, OK? I was 21 years old. Anti-terror rally. I organised this rally when I was 21 years old. I made these leaflets, OK? This will show you that the English Defence League may have been born in 2009. There's a reason. There's a history behind it. When the Beslan Massacre, remember the Beslan Massacre? The ch school children were lined up and murdered by Chechnyan terrorists. They skipped, killed loads of kids in front of their parents. I remember watching that. And then I remember watching an interview of a Muslim from Luton. His name's Saif al-Islam. It means Sword of Islam. He was a part of this organisation called al Majradeen, And he said what happened at that school was justified. And it's justified if it happens in a school in England. That is when I started reading, learning, and looking into who this group were, al Mujahideen. I doubt many people in 2004 had heard of them. Remember, this is before 7-7. This is before terrorist atrocities on our shores. I found that Omar Bakri and Abu Hamza, we all know who they are now. They were based in my town, in Luton. They were based there, their head office was on Biscuit Road. I started looking, researching. What I found terrified me. And once my eyes were open, I couldn't close them to this issue. I made these leaflets. In these leaflets, it's clear. Leaflets circulate in Luton before the demonstration, which started at 1pm, described it as a peaceful protest to stop terrorists recruiting in the town. Headlined Luton Taliban, no thanks. It said Luton residents demand the police and council act now. Close down al Mujahideen's head office in Biscuit Road. Stop Islamic extremists recruiting in the town centre on Saturdays. Clamp down on racist attacks on white and black lads by Muslim gangs. The leaflet claimed Islamic extremism is running out of control in Luton. Muslim fanatics celebrated September 11th outside the Galaxy Centre. Al Mujahideen supporters of global terrorism are based on Biscuit Road. L Luton's Muslims are attending Afghan terror training camps. Magnificent 19 posters glorifying suicide murderers. Churches are being firebombed. Beatings and stabbings of young whites are going on all the time. The demo literature also claimed that members of a Muslim gang, the Gambinos, are more interested in making money from drug pushing and pimping, but they are becoming increasingly close to religious extremists. This was in 2004. If you want to research and go on Google, you will find a, a national newspaper run an article called Chemical Jihad, which they actually named that same gang five years later, saying that they are linked with Al-Qaeda. They are using heroin as a jihad against non-Muslims. What I want you to read by that and understand by that, al Mujahideen are ISIS. That is ISIS. That same mindset that is terrifying the world now. The Home Secretary said four days ago, ISIS is the biggest threat to this country in our history. Okay? That is the same threat. I may not have said it in a posh voice. I may have said it in a different way. We understood who these people were, what their thoughts were, and how dangerous this ideology was. You have to remember that this was before 7-7. 7-7, the terrorists collected their bombs in Luton. I want to bring it home to you again, just to, this is your town. They collected them from a suspected Al-Qaeda operative called Q, who works in a chicken shop in our town centre. He was also the main mind behind the fertiliser bomb plot. I want you to realise that we share a space in Luton, okay? If we have terrorists, they're not from millions of miles away, we have to live with them. The Stockholm bomber come to Luton from Sweden as an innocent Muslim. He was targeted at Luton University by this group who we have been warning about now for 10 years. He was targeted, he was radicalised, and he set off and blew himself up. He lived three doors from my auntie. That group of extremists that I'm talking about were on Luton University in Freshers Week. You're at university, many of you. First time away from home. 
When people are vulnerable, they're weak. You have organisations playing on them to manipulate their mind, change their whole direction in their life and turn them into killers. In this leaflet I say, the council and the police are doing nothing. That was your warning in 2004. If we want to talk about what's happened in between that, many things have happened in between that. We had a soldier's homecoming. Our soldier's homecoming parade which most people see as a catalyst for the EDL. What I want you to realise is there's a lot that's gone on before this that forms your view and forms your narrative and makes you realise how deep this problem is in your hometown, the town that you love. And that, I want you to remember that I'm telling you stories as Tommy Robinson or Stephen Lennon. For every Tommy Robinson or Stephen Lennon, there's one of me. There's people in every town and city across this country who are feeling and seeing these things. So we have a soldier's homecoming. Scott Muntridge died. It's from the estate I lived, up, lived in when I was younger. I was 26 years old. Michael Swain was 19, he lost his legs. Now, our soldiers are returning. I've gone to pay my respects that day because they've, they've sacrificed that for us. As residents of Luton, they've gone there to fight for us, for our freedoms. I've gone there that day and the first thing I've seen is a large police presence. I've then seen Saif al-Islam. I've seen groups of Muslim extremists around the town. I've seen 30 women together in burqas. It's quite a sight. But all of these things, I thought, what's going on? And then I saw this group of protesters, a group of Muslims, taken through my town hall. They were taken through my town hall, and then the soldiers of soldiers marched past. They were called baby killers, murderers, rapists, butchers of Basras. They scot, they spat in the lad's face, one of the soldiers' mum's faces, okay? Now, it wasn't this group done this, because bearing in mind, we know this group. I've looked into this group, I understand their hate. I understand where it's coming from. One of them, that group, the main ginger one, big ginger one with a big beard, he's a convert called Roger, now calls himself Ibrahim. I used to hang around with him when I was younger. One of the other lads in the group, was two years above me at school. This is not a million miles away from us, we get it. Yeah? It was the fact that they were allowed to do it. The police facilitated them in doing it. The council knew they were gonna do it. They leafleted every mosque in the town, telling them they were gonna do it. Intelligence showed that 360 Muslims were arrested, attempting to come into Luton that morning. 360. 70% of their births were in countries outside of the UK. What we saw was an attack on our armed forces. And what I want to ask you, what would you have done? That's your town, okay? What would you have done at that time? Because I contacted the council. I set up a website called Save Luton. I documented that all the continuing things that this group have done in our town. I explained that when Jews were remembering the Holocaust outside our town hall, they had to barricade themselves and lock themselves inside the town hall because this group of large Muslim fanaticals were trying to attack them. In this video, there's a five-year-old girl who's screaming and crying. They attacked the multi-faith march every year. Now, in, in Luton and, state, and, and towns like Luton, when two kids continually cause a disturbance or a nuisance, you get an asbo. Yeah? You asbo them from hanging around together, and you asbo them from an area of the shops. Okay? What we did is we set up a petition asking for this group to be asboed. Quite reasonable, that's what you should do. Well, that's what we did. Five years later, you now see they're talking about Asbone terrorists. Exactly what we were asking them to do before any protests, before we took to any streets. Now we know the police suppress what's going on in the town. We know the Labour councillors, you've seen it with Rotherham, are hiding the facts. We know what's happening in our own town. As I've said, we've foreseen ISIS. We've foreseen all these issues that are going on because we're living it. We're living amongst it, we're breathing it, it's where we live. And we decided then, every community in Luton is allowed to celebrate their identity and their culture. We have St Lucian Day, when it's Paddy's Day, my mum was a Paddy, but when it's Paddy's Day they have a three day festival. We have, when it's Eid, if you want to see any, any Muslims, come to Luton for Eid, because you will have fairgrounds, you will have the biggest celebrations, everything. St George's Day, our day, okay? And I'm just trying to talk to you about how, how we feel in the town. So it comes to St George's Day, Icknell's, Icknell's school, the same school that the girl tried to wear the niqab to, sends a letter out to all the, all the parents. If anyone brings in the emblem of St George on St George's Day, you'll be suspended and sent home. The same school, when Pakistan won the cricket, encouraged everyone to celebrate with Pakistani flags. The message this sends to our kids is they should be ashamed of being English. They should be ashamed of their identity and who they are. Now, this happened three weeks 
after. And then the headline in our newspaper, St George's Day Parade Band. We were supposed to have a parade for the first year. Band. It was at that point that we said, which again, I'll ask you, what would you have done? Okay? What would you have done? Every time your town's name is dragged through the media and the press, it's linked to fanatical jihad terrorism all the time. This is our town. It's where we love. We want to feel safe. This group, when you read what they stand for, they stand for the destruction of this. They stand for the destruction of my family, your family, all of our families now dedicated every day. And I'll try and change it for you to, to people to understand. 75% of Luton is non-Muslim, okay? Let's reverse the roles. Let's make 75% of the town Muslim, 25% of the town white. And in this complete white non-Muslim community, you have got hundreds of the world's most feared Nazis. And they have got pace tables set up and they are promoting hatred against everyone that is not white, okay? Do you think that they are a small group that's gonna be ignored? Because that's all we hear. No one listens to this group. Ignore them, ignore them. In fact, 60% of the people in terrorism are ex-members of al Mujahideen. People do not ignore them, ignore them. they are dangerous. Now, sooner or later, you would see the hate coming out of that little, that little area and coming into your community. You'd witness it. That's what we've witnessed. We have witnessed it. We see the hate. So all this time, we set up a, I set up an organisation called the, the United People of Luton. Now when I'd done this, I named the gangs. I named the heroin. I named their shops. Now, I was 21 years old. Some people would say quite naive. I was a 21-year-old lad with an attitude about what I saw. And I didn't want to back down to it. I don't know how many of you have been laying in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and heard the sound of smashing glass. It's not nice when bricks come through your window. In response to that, I was the target of all the major Pakistani Muslim gangs in my town. I was living at my mother's house, okay? So when this happens, the soldiers homecoming, many of you ask why, or well, people try and belittle me for using a different name, covering my face. I know what's coming. I know what's coming for standing up against these radicals. It's not the radicals that were targeting me, it's the Pakistani street gangs that were targeting me. If you read the 2009 newspaper, you'll realise why. Because the trade between the street gangs and the fanaticals, and the terrorists and the extremists, is combined. The sale of heroin. Now, we set up a group called UPL. Maybe, what would you have done? Again, what would you have done? Bearing in mind the National Front and groups like this, after the soldiers' homecoming, wanted to attach themselves to our town. Would you have made placards that read National Front go to hell? Because that's what we done. Voters demand a St George's Day parade. I want you to understand what this was over. What it was all over. This was the start. When we met up, when we met up this day for this demonstration, it was the community. My aunties were there. We were met by a police presence, a heavy-handed police presence. A horse flattened my uncle. My other friend, Isaac, little black lad, holding one of these placards, reading, National Front Go to Hell. A police officer on a horse knocked his teeth out. Okay? He lost his teeth. We wanted to get to the war memorial. That's it. We were prevented from the police from getting to the war memorial. We were held and kettled for four hours. My auntie had to crouch and we in the street. Now I was there the day that Muslim extremists protested against our soldiers. When we turned up, we were made to line up against the wall. We had cameras in our faces. They put their hands in our pockets. They made us take our shoes off. Names, date of births, addresses. We felt violated by our own police force. Violated in a response where when Muslim fanatics were protesting against our soldiers. You didn't stop them. I was there. You didn't search them. You didn't harass them. You didn't harass their women. But you have us. So this now become about what we saw as oppression. We saw a two-tier policing system which we live under. Where there is an Islamic community, and it's not, maybe not the fault of the Islamic community, but where there is an Islamic community, the police tiptoe around certain issues. We've seen it. You've read it with the Rotherham Report. In that Rotherham Report, you will read incidences where two fathers went to get their daughters back because their daughters were in a house being raped by Muslim men. When they went to get their daughters back, the police arrested the fathers. There was five Muslim men sexually abusing an 11-year-old child in a derelict house. The police turned up and arrested the child for being drunk and disorderly. These sort of stories could sound unbelievable, but they're real. And you need to understand that these stories are happening across the board in towns and cities. You need a report for Rotherham, get a report for every town and city in the country because it's going on. So we had our UPL protest. Bearing in mind we've been asking for petitions to have this group asboed. What did the police do? After our first UPL protest, the police come to 14 of our houses. My mum's was one of them. 
I wasn't there. The other 13 people who were arrested were given bail conditions not to enter the town centre seven days a week, 24 hours a day for three months. So we wanted these extremist radicals banned from our town. And why would we want them banned from our town? Because our mums, our sisters, our daughters, our families have to use that town centre. And when you use that town centre, this group every single Saturday have pace tables set up by Don Miller's Bakery. And that part of town's become a no-go zone because people don't want to get harassed by these lunatics. So we've had our first demonstration. They've given us bail conditions. That's when people have seen our second demonstration, people are wearing balaclavas. I bought those balaclavas and I'll explain why. I gave everyone the balaclavas because the 14, the 14 people who have been given bail conditions not to enter the town centre, we still, all we wanted to do was walk through our own town, get to our war memorial and show that the people of Luton support our armed forces. That's all we wanted to do. If the police would not have prevented us on the first demonstration, we wouldn't have had the second one, it wouldn't have progressed and you wouldn't have seen the English Defence League. That's the reality of it. But the reality is something like the English Defence League was always going to happen because there's these feelings, it's been suppressed, these things, this anger. So we're looking at this group, Al Majordina, who have protested against our, our soldiers. I know their history. I then look and see that they're doing an Islamic roadshow across Britain. They're visiting every town and city. I think this, by now, at what stage do you draw a line? At what stage do you do something? They attack your soldiers. What's next, a soldier's funeral? We've seen the progression, attack your soldiers, Set fire to poppies, cut your heads off. We've all seen what's happened. So in Luton, I ask you, what, what would you have done? When this is going on in your town and the police are not doing anything, no one's stopping this group, they're radicalising, they're converting, their numbers are growing every year. At what stage do you say enough is enough? We have to highlight and tackle this group. I'm now going to show you why the UPL become the EDL. Many of the people in that video are now fighting for ISIS abroad. What they're doing there is they're outside Birmingham Bullring shopping centre. They're stopping an 11 year old boy who's without his parents under a banner that says Jesus was a Muslim and they've converted him as you've all seen. Is there anyone in this room that thinks that's acceptable? That is not acceptable. Could you imagine the reverse if hundreds of radical Christians converted an 11 year old Muslim child walking through the city centre without his parents? There would be uproar. So I sat, I watched this group do this, and I waited. And I thought, let's see what politicians, police, someone's got to do something. Nothing happened. Then, as a group of lads from Luton Town, we decided to leave Luton and go to the Bull Ring in Birmingham with placards that read, what about Sean's rights? Sean was 11 years old. We had placards that read, Muslim, no problem, extremist Muslim, big problem. We had one demonstration, no press reports, no media. We put it online. We decided to go back because we still felt people need to talk about this. This Islamic roadshow had more dates going around the country. This has to be stopped. <coughs> when we went back, subsequently, you can all research this as well. We were locked in a pub for four hours. When we come out, they put us on coaches to get us out of the city centre. We didn't know why. As they drove us out, I saw debris everywhere. Bricks, bottles, everything had been smashed up. Muslim youth, Pakistani Muslim youth, had been rioting for hours. Little did we know that Salma Yaqub, a politician, had riled a crowd with a clenched fist where she said, we must smash the BNP, we must smash the BNP. Muslims then run through the streets, attacking non-Muslims. It later turned out that the local imam had, had told the Muslim youth to come out and confront us. We was only against Anjem Chowdhury's group at this stage, okay? Who was coming out to attack us? Mainstream politicians. I want you, at that, when we went to Birmingham, there were Nazis that turned up. There were Dr. Martins, 
And to us from Luton, anyone know Luton? It's a multicultural town, a very multicultural town. We, you won't find a Nazi in Luton, you can't find one. We've never had racial tensions, we have religious tensions. So for me, we've gone up there to highlight this issue, come under attack from everywhere. I'd ask, what would you do in response to Nazis turning up on the streets with you? A message to Anjan Charlie. We, the English Defence League, we will contest your kind as our forefathers did. At this stage, not really much a mention of Islam, because we're opposing Anjan Chowdhury and his group. That's it. That's our tactics. Now we have Nazis on the streets. We need to let them know they're not welcome. On the first Birmingham demo, five Nazis were getting on the, uh, got put on the coach with us. One of them gave a Hitler salute as he got on. It kicked off when he got to the top of that coach with Luton's lads, yeah? So you have to realise, which I'll show you a video in a minute, where all his friends are talking about this fight that incurred, yeah? And it's a fight that incurred because we don't tolerate that. We would not tolerate that extremism coming from our community, but we see it tolerated, many communities. Now, when we set fire to swastika, not many other groups have done that. Not many other groups have really put it on Nazis. When this happened, I had a phone call from a, a man called Na Nazi Nick, a German. You can all Google him, yeah? I had a phone call and I was told to hand over the control of the English Defence League, hand over the websites, hand over this. I didn't know who he was. I told him in no uncertain terms that it was not going to happen. We had an argument on the phone. I had highlighted myself to some of the world's most feared Nazis. I didn't know who this man was. Only later, my friends, when I was telling him about this Nazi Nick, some fella from Germany, he said, do you know who he is? I said, no. He said, he tried to overthrow the South African government. That's why I thought, damn. Well, I just put it on him. And from that, you can see this. I don't know if you want to read that. It says, English Defence League, since the formation of your organisation, your reliance with external enemies, the Zionists, you have blinded the disgruntled youth to today with your bastardised concept of nationalism. Our concept of nationalism was anyone is welcome to it. White, black, anyone, Muslim, Christian, if you're proud to be English, you're proud of the laws in this country, you're proud of our freedoms, you are welcome. You have attacked lone white nationalists. They wasn't on their own, but this is on about Birmingham. See, the press would not tell you that when there's trouble at the demonstrations in the early days, it's us outrooting the extremists. You have burned our swastika. <laughs> the EDL and the tent. Anyway, I'll carry it on in a minute. You'll see. <coughs> it's quite awkward viewing. But the EDL has come into uh, operation. Uh, they were given it on the streets. Uh, EDL. So, could you imagine, as I walked in this building, all I've been called is a Nazi, okay? We've softened what Nazi means, we've softened what a fascist means. We've started calling anybody who was critical of Islam in any way, gets called a Nazi or a racist or a fascist. It is so frustrating. I'm lucky I'm from Luton Town because everyone in my town knows me prior to the English Defence League. They know there's not a racist bone in my body or an extremist bone in my body. We are witnessing. I'll ask you, I'm witnessing my town. It's from a young lad, from a young age. I'm witnessing changes. I'm witnessing things I don't like to see. I'm now going to show you one more video. I'm sorry, this, sorry about showing the videos. I want, I, want, I want everyone to have a perspective on where I'm coming from, why this happened, yeah? why it spread the way it did, why it was a phenomenon, which it was, it spread across Europe. People were too scared to talk about this issue, okay? It's, there's not much that's good that's come from this for my family or for myself, but this had to happen. Certain things had to be said. I'll show you this video now. This is a four minute video. It's quite shocking, the viewing though. Streets close to East London Mosque, the police closed in. But it was a scuffle with two men that brought things to a head. One in a blue shirt, the other in a red jacket, told them they weren't wanted in the area. As a police officer filmed proceedings, Kevin Carroll claimed he was punched and then he appeared to retaliate. Tommy Robinson looked on from the sidelines. Tommy Robinson bottled it. <laughs> but I'll ask you to view that yourselves. Go on YouTube, put in Tommy Robinson charity walk. What that just showed you is nothing like what happened. And Channel 4 News had the full footage of that incident. So why, when they 
pause it and freeze it on Kevin Carroll looking the aggressive, violent one. I'm saying you need to look beyond the headline. Most of you may judge me on headlines. None of you obviously know me. I get judged a lot on headlines. I'll show you another headline. On Armitage Day, Remembrance Sunday. Clearly, they were not searched before that demonstration in the same way that we are. Clearly, because they had a lot canisters of lighter fluid. Some of the country's most radical Islamist terrorists, sympathizers, and supporters, on Armitage Day, around the corner from a remembrance service, doing this. Okay? I was there that day, and I said, I went up to a police officer, how, how is this being allowed? You should have seen the public's face and reaction to what's going on there. British soldiers burning hell, British soldiers burning hell. The BBC, you want to talk about propaganda? The BBC did not report this. Not one BBC news station reported this. I was arrested at this demonstration. I'll show you what I was arrested for. I was arrested for assaulting a police officer. Now you'll watch the video, which the police did not know I had a video of. You can see the video here. Substantial police presence was needed at a protest in Kensington. A group calling itself Muslims Against Crusades was faced with a counter demonstration by the English Defence League. I'm sorry. A police officer needed hospital treatment for a head injury, though it wasn't serious. The police later gave the Muslim protesters an escort to a local tube station. A black flag that I grabbed, we all now know to be symbolic of ISIS. At that time, it's the black flag of jihad. It's what these radicals were. If you see anyone get their head cut off, it's behind that black flag. So I jumped over a fence. I saw a crime that was being committed on our streets, burning of poppies. Police were allowing it again. So I made a decision to try and prevent them. I was arrested for assaulting a police officer. When I get out, guess what headline went across the BBC? Not just in Bedfordshire, it went Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire. It went everywhere. EDL leader arrested for assaulting a police officer. Okay? That's the propaganda. When I was taken to court for that, I was given, when, when I produced that video, if I, if I didn't have that footage, you'd all be talking about another, you'd all know of another conviction I'd have. And it would be for assaulting a police officer. Because that's, that's what the officer said I'd done, I attacked him. You saw I didn't, yeah? So that's what most people, you judge on headlines, I'm asking that you look beyond the headline. There's usually a different story to what's gone on a lot of the time. I was subsequently taken to court for that. When I produced the video, charges were dropped. They come back to my house eight weeks later and re-arrested me again. I got charged with causing, causing those Muslim men, I caused them alarm and distress. <laughs> I intended to cause them alarm and distress. They, they, were call, they were causing our entire nation alarm and distress, and they were being allowed to do so. I received a, a fine seven times worse than the fine given out to them for burning our poppies. This, I could... I don't want to take up too much. I could continue all day showing you unfair treatment, which you have to understand when you're talking about tensions or community cohesion, all these sort of issues. If you want to talk about community cohesion, you've got 1,400 girls in Rotherham that have been sexually abused and raped. They've all got two or three, four family members. In that small town, you've got 10,000 people that are affected by that. Same in Luton. So I, I, I know countless girls that that has happened to. Countless girls. <coughs> And the two-tier policing system, for example, when they take me to court for those sort of things, and all the people who are following me or sympathetic to what I'm saying, when they're watching all these things play out, when there is such a blatant two-tier system... Let me show you this video. Try not to cheer anyone, yeah? What have I got to talk to you about? Eh? What have I got to talk to you about? Eh? What have I got to talk to you what about? What have I got to say about Islam and that, innit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah? So why don't you say it now? What do you want me to say? Yeah? It's just ideology, it's got no place. Yeah? Yeah, it's got no place, bruv. And what are you Shall got? Shall you like, bruv? You have about 100 of you here in a minute. You f***ing little chief. You f***ing chief. prick. You see? That is, that is his one. I don't know why I called him a chief, but... He was not arrested for that. That went out on Channel 4. National TV. You tell me why he wasn't arrested. I'd have been arrested. We all know I'd have been arrested. I'll get arrested if I drop a bit of litter as we walk out that door. He was not arrested for attacking me. I could tell you countless other times like this. 
My cousin, they, they followed to my family's home. I got a phone call saying that all of this group are outside my family's home. I've rushed up to the home. I've jumped out of my car. Police have turned up. I was arrested. My uncle was arrested. My cousin was arrested. 20 Muslims outside our house. Yeah? After 36 hours, because they got an extension, when I got to interview, I was, what did you find? Because I, I thought they were all going to have weapons in their cars. So what did you find? I could tell straight away by the police officer's face. They didn't even search him. They didn't even search him. So there is a two-tier system. I, many of you may not believe, I could show you countless different things. I'm going to show you now that video first, which I thought I was on. It's a four-minute video. This is a young girl. If many of you may know Stacey Dooley, pretty ginger girl. She has her own program. She's from Luton Town. I grew up with Stacey. So when Stacey come back, she's obviously come back to experience what's gone on. She left Luton eight, nine years ago. She's, quite, she's done quite well for herself. I'm Stacey Dooley, and this is Luton, where I was born. I went to school here. I even worked at the airport, and then I moved away. But now I'm coming home to find out if it's true that Muslim extremists are taking over my town. It didn't take long to witness firsthand the extremism I'd been hearing about. sure what they were marching for, but tensions were running high. Your sister brother, your mother, where is the case? How dare they take our woman? It turns out the demo was in response to the arrest of local woman Mona Thorney, whose husband set off a bomb in Stockholm in 2010. Oh, I cannot believe this. No, 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 no. I've never seen anything on this scale before. No, 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 no. And it breaks my heart. Everyone's got a right to protest, but I found their chanting provocative and extreme. British police, go to hell! British police, go to hell! This is the message to stop oppression. Police burning hell! British police burning hell! Yeah, because no real Muslim wants anyone to burn in hell. Yeah, but for what they've done, for the consequences You can't of pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. You, you either believe or you disbelieve. I, you know you what? You choose to wear this, I choose to wear that. You and I will That's have to... You look naked on the street. Do I look naked? Do I really? I don't look naked. Are you trying to seduce? No one's trying to seduce me, and I'm not trying to seduce anyone. You shouldn't judge me how I try not to judge you. You are. You've just said, who am I trying to seduce? No one. Well, I don't judge you because I'm above that. Excuse me, go put on some clothes. How you choose to live so, how you choose to dress like that, I choose to dress like this. You don't start. Don't you dare speak to me like that. No, but this is my hometown as well. No, I'm walking. I am walking. No, I can do what I want. That girl's just I don't mind. Point away. Point away. Because you're not scaring me. I try my hardest to sympathise with people who are maybe different to me. And it's a tiny minority that play up. Who are you trying to seduce? Go and put some clothes on, you look naked. Oh. Such a shame. Do you think it's fair that you should say British police need to burn in hell? In Islam, doesn't it say that you have to respect the law of the land that you're living in? No. Mm, I thought it did. What's the solution? You know, if Muslim people are in the wrong and they are committing <laughs> crimes, you know, no one's above the law. If the law of the land is Islamic, we respect the law of the land. What if it's not Islamic? If it's not Islamic, then the law of the land and those who make it can go to hell, quite honestly, because oh Allah said in the Quran, God. in chapter 33, verse 1, he said, O Prophet, fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Is David Cameron a Muslim or a disbeliever? 
guys. I can't speak leave. on camera. So you can't, obviously. you can't, you can't obey him. So, so he can go to hell as well as all think, the other leaders. Do you, do you uh, let think me tell I you, should go let to me hell? Tell you I'm a non-Muslim. You're on your way to the hellfire because you're a non-Muslim. All non-Muslims, all non-Muslims are destined for the hellfire. Do you really believe and, uh, that? Yes, and you will be fueled for the hellfire as well. But the fact is that you have an opportunity to change. That hurts me to think that you you think that of me because you don't really know me and you think I'm destined to hell. You said you said you said you're not a Muslim, so that's enough for me to know that you're not Muslim. So you're not Muslim, you're destined for the hellfire, unless you change. I find it sad that anyone would preach such a damning message. To sum up in words, even to tell you how I'm feeling right now, I feel um, completely gutted, gutted that this is happening. <laughs> Gutted so much that she brought to tears again. I'm not trying to portray all the Muslims in Luton are like this. I'm trying to show you there's a problem, okay? There's a problem where we live. She says, this is my town as well. It is her town, okay? We should not be seeing that. How much of that should we tolerate? When people come out and protest against that? Far right, racist, thugs. There's an issue. Many issues. You saw the madrasas, undercover madrasas, where we see children being things beaten into them. My friend Sully is a Muslim. His mum's black Kenyan, his dad's Christian. That's very rare. I spoke to someone else like that. That's rare in Luton. He went to a madrasa. He came to our school then when he was 12. And he told us that he had to leave his school because they started teaching him that his dad had the devil in him because he wasn't a Muslim. Now, Sully went on to join the Royal, the Royal Navy. He is a, a loyalist. Queen and country. He hated the English Defence League. Yeah? Many of my friends didn't like the English Defence League. I'm trying to bring you into the personal story of my life because it's not as black and white, excuse the pun, as everyone wants to pretend it is. I'm not from this white area and white community. I didn't just wake up one day and think, you know what, I hate Muslims, because I don't. There's been an issue, there's been a story, there's a reason for a lot of this. In 2010, I set up a meeting with Theresa May. Obviously not to meet me, she didn't think she was meeting me, she thought she was meeting one of her constituents. I turned up instead. I turned up, I brought a laptop with me, and I spent 20 to 25 minutes grilling her. You can read the story because the Daily Mail straight away, she must have some link, it got leaked straight away, the EDL leader ambushes Theresa May. Now, when I sat down with her, I explained her to her my fears in Luton about Islamic extremism. Because that's what they are, they're fears. That scares me. This ideology scares me, I've got three young kids. There's different sorts of fears. I've been in some bad situations. I got put in Woodhill Prison, Category A prison, where four Muslims were in there who were in there for 30 years because they were planning to kill and blow us up. Yeah? I've had some very difficult situations and that's a different sort of fear. Okay? I can deal with that. I can deal with a fear if I walk down the street and 10 Pakistani lads want to come over and have, I can deal with that. There's a fear I can't deal with. It's a fear when I look around my town, I look around my country and I look at my kids and I get this gut-wrenching fear that will not go away. That's a lot of what drives, it drives me, it's a lot. A lot of people say there's a fear, there's a reason why people are doing these things. Now in 2010, I saw Theresa May, I explained to her about Luton Islamic Centre and the Imam called Qadir Basque. I'd be, they're part of my local council, yeah? Luton in Harmony programme. In, in, in the docu that documentary, Proud and Prejudice, that the Imam was portrayed as the moderate Imam from Luton. I've been on his website, okay? On his website, on the mosque website, it says we should execute homosexuals. A 12-page justification is why women should be lashed for adultery. I knew he was a school teacher. He was, um, so I warned Theresa May of all of this in 2010. 2014, let me play a video of a conversation between me and Kadir. The problem I have is that, can you blame us when we're seeing this? Then when we see a, a moderate imam put forward, Luton has 30 mosques, only one Salafi, one Wahhabi, yeah? Who's the face all the time? Who's the representative that the council go to, the newspapers go to, the TV go to, to get their view on everything? The Salafi mosque, the Salafi is, I, I, imam. He has been em empowered by my council to be the face, and he's not representative of the majority of Muslims in Luton, but that's what we see. Now, th when I left the English Defence League, who did the radio station go straight to? Again, Qadir Basque, the moderate imam. 
missed. As I was talking about Tommy Robinson, asking your questions about him, uh, he came knocking on our door, and now he's sitting here in the studio with us. He's joined in the studio now by Kadir Batch from the Luton Islamic Centre, uh, who we had as an arranged guest on this subject as well. So we've ended up having a bit of a Barney about all of this. Uh, and just before the news, Kadir, uh, you said that in an ideal society there would be punishments for example homosexuals and Tommy Robinson had put the point to you that this is why he was concerned by your ideology which is why he was anti-Islamic and anti-Islamization and put Luton Islamic Centre in that camp do you understand why Tommy Robinson might be concerned by Islamic ideology when even though you say we don't want it in Britain you do use phrases like in an ideal society and then come up with a statement like that yeah that's, that's, that's fair enough he has every right to disagree and to criticise it, because look, you know, uh, you can look at how, how, how the Sharia is established in, in Saudi Arabia, for example. Do the people fear the Sharia? They don't fear it. But actually, actually, you haven't said that. I haven't said that. You know, sometimes from, from the, the things that people fear is what keeps society in order. Like, you know, you fear going to prison so you, don't, so you do not commit a crime. You know, it's, it's similarly like that. It's a deterrent. The Sharia rules are deterrents. They're not implemented. How many hands get chopped off? How many women get slashed? Uh, lashed? And it just doesn't happen. Very, very, very few. So 40, I mean, how, uh, it just doesn't, uh, okay. it, in an ideal Islamic, Islamic society, these laws do not get implemented. They're just deterrents. OK, final question for Mr Robinson, then we have some calls, and I want you to talk to our listeners. What Kadir's saying is that gays should be too scared Fun. to be gay. Fun. I have a problem when this man is a representative of the Muslim community in my town. I have a problem. I have a problem when I first met him, I called a meeting with him, I went to meet him. It's because the, all these tensions were in the town and he's the main face, he's the main person I fought to see. When he walked in he said, Tommy, Sharia law will not come to this country in your lifetime. Probably not your sons, but the generation after that. So thank you for concreting why I'm resisting this, Kadir. Now, I've never understood the term, I hate to say I told you so. Yeah? But I now understand it. Because it's not a nice feeling. We warned of grooming. You've read the Rotherham report. This is from so 2000, what is it that 2010. Defend England against the spread of Sharia law, the spread of terrorism, the spread of extremism, Islam, Islamisation, the political wing of Islam. That's what we're trying to could do. Could a Muslim join the English Defence League? Of course they could, yeah. Of course well, they could. And yet you say you're not against Muslims. No. They could join your organisation, but you are against Islam. We're against Islam taken in its seventh century barbaric form. Well, Which your when direct taken, quote is, I'm not against Muslims, just Islam. Against militant Islam. And when I say Islam, taken in its 7th century barbaric form. If Islam was to yeah. evolve, which it needs to evolve, well, to, fit in with, to fit in with Western democracy, which is clearly not, clearly there's a problem. Clearly, the English Defence League is a phenomenon that swept this country. And with, with the issues I'm talking about, Jeremy, if I ask you, do you know anyone that's hooked on heroin sold to them by Muslim gangs? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any beautiful girls that you went to school with that are now wearing a burqa that, that don't see their family? Probably don't. I do. Do you know anyone who's been murdered by a Muslim gang? You probably don't. I do. Do you know any 15-year-old girls that you know that you've grown up with that have so, been raped or pimped? You don't. So I don't expect you to all, understand the these issues. These are all personal issues of yours. Personal issues in towns and cities like mine that are happening and they're not happening with the Sikh community, they're not happening with the Jewish community. And indeed they're not happening with most Muslims. No, they're, they're, they're happening within the Islamic community. That's what I'm saying, that it's an Islamic problem. And, and when I'm just a simple person, so I'm just a normal person, but when I'm looking at I have to look for where this hatred is coming from. And, rather, and talking about these girls like they're statistics, they're not so, statistics. These girls are... Well, who's, whose daughters do you think these are? The, whose sisters? They're ours in working-class towns and communities. And people are right. fed up with what's going on. Been, and it is being ignored. For 20 years, our, okay. our, 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 our councillors and the, and, the, and the leaders from the Islamic community have conspired with the police to not deal with Muslim pimping gangs. They've allowed systematic rape of our youth right. by the fact of being scared to be called a racist. Or... There's another quick video. No Muslim youth, no Muslim girls... Rape him, 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 beating, abusing our whole system. Rather than deal with these gangs, they would rather persecute us, the people who are highlighting the issue. And the fact is, the police, the councils, the government, everyone needs to wake up. Many of the issues when we formed the EDL that I wanted to raise and wanted to bring to the surface have been brought to the surface. Many of them. If you wish to, you can draw a graph on the arrests. Do it yourself. Look at the arrest rate for Muslim grooming gangs, which is a big problem in many of our communities. You'll see a line go straight across like this, English Defence League forms, the arrests go through the roof. Only 
when people took to the streets, only when they could not hide this fact any longer, because they've hid it, only when the world's media were listening to us talk about what's happening to our family members and the police are facilitating it, did they do anything about it. But I'll tell you one story, I stayed in Blackburn for the night before a demonstration. I spent with the time of a family. I listened to horrific stories of what's happening to their 12-year-old daughter. She's going missing as well for days. She's got a 19-year-old brother in that room that's telling me the stories. I mean, horrific. When you hear these sort of stories and you're having to listen to all these things that are going on, it's going on everywhere. The next day we're at the demonstration, it's all kicking off. I've gone down to the front where it's kicking off to try and calm people down. Who's at the front kicking off with the police? Her brother. There's usually a lot of reason for the anger that people are seeing, okay? To just label it and ignore it. The main reason I want to get across is why. That's the point I'm getting to is why. Another point I'll make to you about prison. I've been in prison. Woodhill is an ISIS training camp. That's it. Our category A jails now are radicalising and radicalising. We've got 800 coming out a year. When you go to jail, you're weak, you're vulnerable. You're now being turned to hate the system, hate the country, hate everything about us. And I'll make this claim now. At some time, this speech will be looked back upon after a prison convert has come out, maimed, killed and murdered on our streets because it's going to happen. There's nothing being done. They're not segregated, they're not isolated. In 2012, I spent 20 weeks on solitary confinement. These terrorists are not on solitary confinement. They're on the wings, converting, making people take the shahada, converting them. The, the imams, even in Wadil, are trying to do something. They're not trusted, they're not listened to, they're seen as stooges. People are not converting with the imam, they're converting with the radicals who are running the wings. In 2012, I spent 20 weeks. I flew to America on September 11th on someone else's passport. Pretty stupid thing to do, yeah? I got 10 months in jail for it. I thought it was quite harsh, but I got 10 months in jail. I spent 20 weeks in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, 23 and a half hours a day. I was locked up. For half an hour a day, I got let out to walk around a cage on my own. Put back in. Meals brought to your room. They're not allowed to do that, actually. You're only allowed to do that for 30 days because your mental health. It's not good for your mental health. To get around that, they moved me from Wandsworth block, Bedford block, Woodhill block, Wandsworth block, Wayland block. I was not allowed out of my cell because I'd be killed. My family noticed the difference in me as a person when they come to visit. Because of this, you see, fear is paralysing. And it's fear that paralysed the Rotherham's police force. It's fear that paralysed our politicians. It's fear that has paralysed the British public to put up and tolerate with many of the things that are happening in this country. I got, my family contacted human rights lawyers. They explained, listen, our son has spent 12 weeks in solitary confinement. Listen to all the things. All the human rights lawyers are like this. You've def definitely got a case. This is out of order. We'll get a judicial review. Yeah, he's the leader of the English Defence League. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what I mean, we can't, we, can't, we can't represent him. That's how toxic it, it's become. That's how powerful political correctness is. My family then looked for who represented Jamie Bolger's killer. Child killer. Cut off the penis of a child and fed it to him. Disgusting, sick. They contacted him. Went through the same scenario, explained the situation. Got to the fact that I was a leader in the English Defence League. Whoa, I can't touch him. He represented a child killer. He would not represent me. That is the, how toxic it had become to speak out and be critical of what I've seen. Now, we tried to get ASBOs. We did contact the council before any street protests. I'm not going to stand here and pretend I'm an angel, because I'm far from it. I'm not going to stand here and defend the actions of every English Defence League demonstration either, because some of them are indefendable, and I wouldn't want to anyway. What I would also point out, ISIS. Many ISIS fighters for ISIS, there's a lad I know from Luton who's out there fighting for him. They're coming back. I draw the point. They are following from scripture from the Quran. They practice from the same Quran that the Kurds who are fighting for freedom also follow. So I'm not saying all Muslims are bad. I'm saying what, I want, what I've tried to do today and what I'm trying to paint a picture of is why. I want you to understand why. If we want to talk about my beliefs, I'd rather you heard my beliefs from my mouth. I'm called far right. I'm putting a box of the right wing because in this country we like to do that. It makes, it makes things less complicated. Many of my v views are left wing and liberal. I just have a problem with what I see as fascism. I have a problem which I see as extremism. And any group like these clowns that are outside today who are government funded, okay, linked with trade unions, 
It's their job to oppose fascism. Where were they? Where were they? With the rise of what Theresa May is now saying is the biggest threat to this country's history. My views are my views. I'm entitled to them. It's coming to an end now, but what I want you to ask yourselves again is, what would you have done on your soldiers' homecoming? What would you have done witnessing the things you have growing up? What would you have done when you see your culture eroded, your identity disappearing, you see Sharia patrols, neighbours are being forced from their homes? What would you have done? As a young lad from Luton, I've made the decision. I've done what I did. I've done it, and I want you to know that it was born out of passion for what was right. It wasn't born out of hatred. To say this was all done out of hatred would be absurd. I've put my life on the line and had many negative effects from that, especially when we come down to the police. I was talking earlier about freedoms. I'm on a licence condition, I can't contact the EDL. I believe that we should all be fearful. If I went through a full story, I'd love to come back and have time to talk about this, and I'm running out of time. I'd love to talk to you all about everything that's gone on with, with the police, because if they can do it to me, they can take away my freedoms. They can do it to you. It should be of worry to everyone. Finally, interfaith. We have interfaith policies across this country. Rip them all up, they're useless. They're completely useless. In my town, we have Sikh leaders, Muslim leaders, Christian leaders, twice a year, take a photo of each other, put their arm around them, stick it in the paper, that's their interfaith. It's not doing anything. It's no good. The people, if we're serious and we, we want to solve this problem, our country has deep wounds. If we want to solve these wounds, you know the people you need to bring together? People on those EDL demos and the young kids being attracted to those Islamist organisations. It's the only way. The only way is with, with dialogue. And if I talk about, I many, many times I say we need a revolution. I don't mean we need a revolution. We need a revolution within the Islamic community. We can't solve this, these problems. The problems will be solved by Muslims. I've seen, I'm having a meeting this week with Muslims in Luton who are running a campaign saying, not in my name. I watched the video, it was an hour and 20 minutes, it's a good video by the Imam. And I sat there and thought, this is what we've been asking for. We've been asking, we've been asking for Muslims to get as outraged as us at what these fanatics are doing. We've been asking for a clear wedge and a difference and a, a clear difference between your ordinary Muslims and these Wahhabi Salafi extremists. And for the first time, I think, I'm yet to be completely convinced, but it is the only route forward and the only path forward that I see if we want to save, hand down a safe and prosperous Britain. I'd like to thank you again. I hope it's give you a better insight. Some of you may still hate me, but I'd like to give, to give a better insight into who I am, where I've come from, the reasoning behind the formation of the English Defence League. Obviously, I've left the English Defence League now, and I'll try as best I can to answer any of your questions. I wish I could stand here and speak freely, but... Um, there's certain topics I can't really branch into because I will be recalled to prison. I have three young, beautiful children. Christmas is five weeks away and I noticed the massive effect it had on them when their dad was locked in prison. So I spoke to you earlier about it. A year ago, I would have stood up here and you know what, I'd have said whatever the hell I wanted because I felt my freedom of speech was being eroded and I'm quite stubborn throughout the years. But I can't, I can't put my family through that. So again, thank you for inviting me.